towers once served as the operational hub at many railroad locations and kept the railroad moving. Without them, railroads could get clogged up if the train crews had to go out and align all of the switches at a busy junction. Before the tower became popular, a signalman would have to manually set each signal and or turnout switch to the desired indication. Not only was this very time consuming, it was also very costly and it didn't take the railroads long to realize that controlling a section of signals from one location would not only reduce maintenance costs but also increase efficiency. The railroad tower, also known as a signal box on English railroads and as cabins on American railroads like the C&O, were once a vital part of the railroad network centralizing a group of signals at a busy location such as a junction, a crossover, or a diamond into one location with an operator who would manually set the signals to the appropriate readings. And although interlocking towers were normally found near intersecting rail lines and junctions, they could be found anywhere the railroad deemed necessary. Towers housed an interlocking machine that was controlled by an operator or a leverman. The operator would pull various levers which would align switches and signals to the appropriate reading, proceed, stop, caution, etc., through a series of trackside pipes. These levers were often called Armstrong levers because you had to have strong arms in order to operate the machine as the pipes could be up to a mile long. The interlocking machine itself was actually an early type of computer. The ingenious design of the interlocking mechanism allowed the operator to manipulate various levers without permitting conflicting routes and thus preventing accidents. Each interlocking machine was custom designed and built for the specific section of track that it controlled. Another interesting feature of the railroad tower was how it was built. The interlocking machine would be installed at the site first, then the frame of the tower was built around the machine. Interlocking towers were usually built as two-story structures because of the size and the complexity of the interlocking machine. The inner workings of the machine were located on the first floor while the operator was on the second floor. Although mechanical interlocking towers were a technological achievement for the railroads in the late 19th century, newer ones were built with electrical or electro-pneumatic components with switches and signals controlled with a simple twist of a handle. However, as technologies improved, interlocking towers were increasingly updated with electronic control panels that allowed for the pushing of a few buttons to control a signal or switch point. These panels also gave operators a scaled readout of the track in which they controlled and what switch points were being manipulated. As technologies improved and the signals and interlocking locations could be controlled over long distances with the introduction of radio and more recently GPS, the need for a centralized manned towers has virtually disappeared. Not only has efficiency been increased, but also a reduction in cost, which we know is something the railroads love seeing. Railroad technology continued to evolve, and thousands of towers across the United States eventually fell victim to more modern advancements in train control. As early as the 1930s, railroads began closing interlocking towers in favor of centralized traffic control as a way to manage the movement of trains. After World War II, the railroads continued pushing CTC as the practical way of controlling train movement. More and more towers continued to close and by the 1980s, most railroad towers in the United States had been replaced by computer controls in remote dispatching centers. For example, the tower at the very busy intersection of Fostoria, Ohio, originally built by the b and was transferred in March of 2015 from the F Tower to the CSX IP Dispatcher. About 120 trains a day pass through Fostoria on the three main lines including the X b and between Chicago and Pittsburgh, the X C and O between Toledo and Columbus, and the X Nickel Plate Road, now Norfolk Southern, between Bellevue and Fort Wayne, Indiana. We can only imagine what hub and gateway cities like Chicago, St. Louis, Kansas City, and Minneapolis, St. Paul were like during the heyday of railroading when almost everything was controlled from towers. Fortunately for us, there are active rail fans and volunteers that are willing to commit their time and resources to saving them, as witnessed by the one here in Scranton. In downtown Harrisburg at the corner of 7th and Walnut Streets, across from the Forum, Harris Tower Railroad Museum is open for visits. The museum is a railroad control tower built by the Pennsylvania Railroad in 1930 to control all train movements through downtown Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Listed in the National Register of Historic Places, the tower once controlled the switches and signals that routed more than 100 passenger trains a day through the central Pennsylvania area. The tower was used by the Pennsylvania Railroad, the Penn Central, and Amtrak until closing in 1991. Upon closing, the Harrisburg chapter of the National Railway Historical Society purchased the building and began the process of restoration. After an extensive restoration project spanning more than 15 years and thousands of dollars in volunteer hours, Harris Tower opened to the public as a living history interpretive rail museum in 2008.
The centerpiece of the exhibit is the tower's interlocking machine and model board, both of which are fully operational. Visitors to Harris Tower can actually operate levers of the interlocking machine and see what happens by way of the lighted model board display, exactly as it was done decades ago. The interlocking machine and model board have been tied into a computer simulation system that is programmed with the actual Pennsylvania Railroad train schedules from the early 1940s. It is then up to the visitor to throw the proper levers to route the trains to their correct destinations. In this way, rather than simply viewing a static display, visitors to Harris Tower can actually operate the equipment and experience for themselves what it would have been like to work for the Pennsylvania Railroad in its heyday. To the best of my knowledge, there is no other exhibit like the Harris Railroad Switch Tower anywhere in the world. And in addition to the hands-on experience of working the levers of an actual railroad tower, the tower sits right next to the very active main lines of Norfolk Southern and Amtrak, which makes the Harris Interlocking a perfect place to see and photograph dozens of NS and Amtrak trains each day from a safe location, regardless of the weather. Admission to the tower is free, but donations are welcomed and appreciated. For a schedule of times when the Harris Tower is open or for additional information on group visits, check out www.harristower.org or contact the Harrisburg chapter of the National Railway Historical Society at 717-232-6221 or by email at harristower at verizon.net. Back down in Steamtown, the DL3 was coming in from Taylor Yard with 80 heavily laden carloads of grain and sand. The last 26 cars will be set out and delivered up the Carbondale main line on another day. The five locomotives on this train and the 54 grain loads will make up the bulk of today's PO74 to Mount Pocono, Pennsylvania. Along the way, it will work a lumber customer in Cresco as well as a propane facility in Toby Hanna. Number 3007 and the three units that it's coupled to are the helper locomotives for this train. There are two six axles on the head end and two in the helper set leaving only the number 41, which hasn't been put into service yet, the only DL six axle not on this train. Head tail end just cleared, whatever you bring her to an easy stop will do. Back up near the tower, the signal that stands in Renaissance Park waits patiently for a train that will never come again. As I pointed out in other videos, the park is a great place to catch train action early in the morning when the sun is on your side. On the other side of the tracks, now the sunny side, we get a unique perspective from the second floor of the tower as the DL3 connects to another cut of cars along with the helpers to prepare for the eastbound assault over the Pocono Mountains.
rolling stock of the BNSF is commonplace on trains like the DL3, the PL74, and the NSK82 and H97 locals that shuttles them to and from Binghamton, New York. Where Warren Buffett's rolling bread baskets aren't common is on the Lions Road trains like today's 36T for which some reason, one that I can't explain, has a long cut of the big brown covered hoppers in its manifest. Helper operations in northeastern Pennsylvania go back for as long as trains have been moving coal and merchandise out of the area. There are three lines that have to climb their way out of the region. The Sunbury Line north to Clark Summit, the former Lehigh Valley Mountain Cutoff south to Penobscot, and the former Erie Lackawanna, nay Lackawanna, main line southeast through the Poconos. On mile post 692, a.k.a. Buttonwood Yard on the Sunbury Line, the DMS siding, in addition to unloading salt and loading scrap metal, was used as a helper pocket in the 2000s when NS coal trains to Johnson City, New York and Bow, New Hampshire were a common sight on the line. Helper power usually consisted of two Canadian Pacific SD-40s of various types as shown here in 2003. This siding was also used for locals to duck out of the way of mainline trains as was the case on another day when I caught some DNH and CP power sitting in the siding. Today, the siding no longer sees any rail service but is used to park maintenance of way machines and railroad owned vehicles as shown by the new fence and the rocky road to the left. And trains, when they need <coughs> a push to get over the line, have to struggle their way to Taylor if they make it that far at all where the locals K81 
K82 or K79's power will tack onto the rear and shove them up to Clark Summit. It was going to be a while before the PL-74 took off for the Poconos, so we drifted back down to ground level. The most exciting part of being in the tower for me was the chance to scale the timeless spiral staircase. These were a common fixture in towers of all kinds. Directly adjacent to the tower are the old locomotive shops of the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western. It was here that many of Lackawanna steam locomotives were born. Today, this building is a government munitions plant. Down at ground level, the track of the Laurel Line and the Electric City Trolley run between the shops and the tower. Back up at the tower, the roughly half mile stretch from the Steamtown Switch to the Harrison Avenue overpass is a great place to watch trains blasting out of town. Along the way, there's a small row of houses overlooking the tracks that's appropriately called Ridge Row. When talking about the old Lackawanna and Erie Lackawanna lines, I still can't help but wonder how Northeastern Pennsylvania's railroad map would look today in 2019, specifically here in town, had the Chessie system not had backed out of buying the Erie Lackawanna and the Reading Railroad. While waiting for the PO 74 to take off, something caught my attention. The wheel flanges. It continues to fascinate me to no end how that little metal lip can keep thousands of tons of cargo and steel from plunging into oblivion. Another thing that got my attention was the Trinity Rail manufacturing sticker on the side of the car. As we talked about in the last video of this year's summer special, Trinity covered hoppers are an industry standard and can be seen in unit trains, class 1, and short line service all over the United States, Canada, and Mexico.
Although it took more than a half hour, the PO-74 finally got underway and elbowed its way out of town with thunderous momentum. We still have a lot more summer rail fanning for 2019 and we'd like you to be in on the fun. Make sure that you hit the subscribe button on your way out and like this video while you're at it. For Trains 21, call me AC.